To talk about green thinking in the last 10 years, we've got Zach Goldsmith, who's uh, MP for uh, Richmond, um, and before that was uh, editor of The Ecologist magazine for many years. Um, so, Zach, take us back to the millennium, 2000. What were the issues in then? We just had the, uh, we'd had the great Seattle World Trade yeah. Organization conference. What else was on the agenda? How was, how was thinking going then? Well, I, I mean, I think, first of all, you saw an evolution around that time of, of green thinking to incorporate economics and trade, which is why you had the big anti-WTO protest and so on, where people were seeing that the global free trade agreements were almost making it illegal for countries to put up any kind of environmental protections, which are always interpreted as barriers. So that continued, and that continued right the way through. Throughout my time as the ecologist editor, we were always coming back to this theme. But then you had pockets of issues which endured, and a really big one was GM food. Mm -hmm. And we saw an enormous consumer backlash, um, which, which tapped into popular culture. And so you saw the mass media. In fact, you saw an extraordinary uh, coalition formed between the male group and The Guardian, which were the two sort of leading newspapers. And The Ecologist was a kind of radical wing there, dealing with this issue on an almost monthly basis. Mm -hmm. And we saw an enormous uh, a, a consumer movement, which really heavily influenced the behavior of the supermarkets and effectively pushed GM off the menu for, for a long period of time. It's coming back now as it happens. So food was right food on was, the agenda. Food was a really big issue, and it took up a lot of our time. Taking on the big GM giants, we took on Monsanto, a very, very litigious company. We were threatened by them. Uh, incessantly and in fact we expected to go to court so we were very very careful with the report we put out which is called the Monsanto files and instead of coming for us they went for the printers the distributors and so on and it never got out from it was delayed by a month. Do you think the anti-GM movement won the battle or was it just one battle in a great war? I think it won a lot of battles but I think the war continues and there's a, there's a very very sort of wide variety of views on this from people who were involved at the time. I still think um, that the battle, the war continues. I think that GM was never about fe feeding the world or dealing with environmental problems. Mm -hmm. It was always about control of the food economy mm -hmm. by a very small handful of very, very powerful corporations. And that hunger for control is always going to be there. That seems to be one of the great uh, uh, themes of the, of the Green Movement over the last 20 years. It's about control. It's about who yeah. has the power to, 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 to shift things. Is that a, was that a yeah. big shift in thinking from you know, from the 1980s and 1990s? I suppose if you go back far enough, um, environmentalism was, it, it was quite sort of patrician. It was top down. It was very much um, about telling people what was best for them. And I think the change um, really came about with a recognition of the economic dynamic and the, the, the forces which are really propelling us in the wrong direction, a recognition that actually the future, the answer has to lie in reclaiming some of that power away from the giant corporations. And we're at a point where you've got individual companies vastly bigger than whole economies. Um, so it's, it's um, and it's just not a healthy situation to be in. We, as consumers, as individuals, as voters, we lose all bargaining power. But so that, that was a big part of it. That was an international agenda referred to in, in, in local terms, but it was basically international. Yeah, it? it was. And I think there were, there were many different ways in which people took that on. You had a, a proliferation in the number of farmers' markets, which mm -hmm. people saw as a kind of, mm -hmm. a, as a, almost a revolutionary movement. Mm -hmm. You had the, the box schemes, people signing up to have vegetables delivered. All that happened in the same, you know, very, very quickly. You had dis small local distribution companies suddenly becoming quite big because people tapped into that. Big organic, and it wasn't just about organic food. It was, it was, it was more about local food, about mm -hmm. about diversity, about shortening the links between producers and consumers, and that applied across the board, including with democracy. Recognition mm -hmm. that localization of democracy is as much as a, a part of this as anything else, mm -hmm. and that's where a lot of people's euroscepticism came from. That's where my euroscepticism comes from. How did this agenda fit in then with the agenda of climate change, which? presumably also came up in the, in the yeah, last 10 years. If you think, I mean, around the time of the millennium, climate change was becoming an issue, obviously. It was not, you know, everyone knew about climate change, but it became mainstream during that decade. And you had a... a, a How come? What happened? Well, and I think a lot of different things happened. You had the emergence of, of, of a scientific consensus. Now, you get shot for saying that because you can never have a complete consensus in science. But as, as much as science allows a consensus, we had it on climate change, all the national science academies, all the major economies and so on. You had an awakening at the, at the political level with political leaders, in, including our own in this country, really acknowledging the gravity of climate change. And then you had the, uh, the Al Gore 
uh, film, uh, Inconvenient Truth, which I mean, I saw the impact this film had on people, on skeptical mm -hmm. people, and I saw the impact it had on people in schools and so on, and it really did open people's eyes. So you had this moment, really, when everyone seemed to accept that climate change was a problem and that we had to deal with it. Uh, I mean, I, I have my uh, doubts about whether or not that was completely a good thing. Obviously, mm -hmm. it was a good thing that people began to get their heads around climate change in a way that we never had before, but it seemed to happen to the exclusion, to the cost of other environmental concerns. It did seem that the Friends of the Earth, the Greenpeaces, and all yeah. the organizations, the NGOs, all latched on to climate change as a great issue of the, of, it, of the age. It became the issue, and part of the reason for that, I think, is that, that all the foundations out there suddenly became interested in climate change and they would fund climate related work. So a lot of the other stuff kind of slipped off the agenda. And we became, you know, the environmental movement suddenly was all about carbon. It wasn't about the real environment that we can see and touch and feel and, and that we're familiar with. So food began to get knocked off the agenda. Biodiversity began to get knocked off the agenda. Things like air quality just Air quality and so on. When we talked about forests, we talked about them as carbon sticks effectively, things that absorbed carbon as opposed to things which have an inherent value in and of themselves. So I think that was a real problem. And I think we're still there actually. We're beginning to broaden out and we're beginning to see biodiversity becoming an issue again. So you're saying that the, in a way the Greens went, or the Green movement went too far in that one direction? I, I think they did go too far. And I think there's, um, I mean, the, the reality is that most of the thing, if not all of the things that you need to do to deal with climate change are things that we have to do in any case. Mm -hmm. We need to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels uh, mm -hmm. for political reasons, economic reasons, mm -hmm. social reasons. Uh, uh, we need to protect the forest, not just because they absorb carbon, but because without them our entire uh, a, a, a climatic system Mm -hmm. collapses, not just in terms of climate change, but in terms of rainfall patterns and so mm -hmm. on. That biodiversity is important, that diversity generally is probably the best hedge we have mm -hmm. against, uh, against change. So I, 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 there's, there's that, that recognition, I think, is coming back now, and we're seeing much more emphasis on biodiversity. But there was a moment, I think, quite a long moment, where, where really it was all about carbon. In retrospect, do you mm -hmm. think that, that we went too far and we, we, it needs to come back now very much? Yeah, I do. Uh, and and I, I find myself now when I talk about environmental issues or whether I'm lobbying the government or whether I'm talking to, to, to people who I think aren't quite there yet, um, mm -hmm. I talk less about climate change now and more about food security. The fact that we're growing way beyond our ecological means, that we're forests, oceans, marine uh, uh, fish, uh, soil, air and so on, that all the indicators are moving in the wrong direction. And actually with Rio coming up, mm -hmm. um, we're going to see, I think, um, a, 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 some quite startling um, truths in relation to our, our... It was the Labour government for most of those 10 years. Mm. Was it rather convenient for them to, to have one issue called climate change and then the rest basically dropped off the agenda and they didn't have to address them? Yeah, I, I, I think that's probably right because you can you can address, if you're just looking at climate change, you don't really have to address the economic system in quite the same way. Mm. You can, you, there's masses of opportunity for growth in low carbon economics, for example, mm. masses mm. of opportunities to, to sort of tinker without really going to, to ch changing fundamentally our relationship with the natural world around mm. us. Mm. Um, you, you could solve climate change without addressing the fact that, you know, four fifths of the world's great fisheries have either collapsed or they're on the brink of collapse. Mm. Mm. You, could, you could solve these issues without addressing really chronic water shortages affecting more than 100 countries. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're all linked, these issues, obviously, mm -hmm. but by focusing just on carbon, I think it did allow us to take our eye off the ball. Mm. The protest presumably reflected this shift in agendas as well. So you had climate change pr protests, and yeah. the climate camps. You, you, and yeah, and, and all that, and that, that's, that was really valuable in terms of raising awareness around these issues. And you had, you had bespoke campaigns as well. You had the, you know, the campaign uh, uh, against King's North Power Plant, for example, mm -hmm. being, and you had only four or five people climbing, climbing you know, I forget exactly what impact they had, but they, they scaled the, mm -hmm. the, the towers and they were arrested and they were taken through court and they were won, they were acquitted. I was one of the witnesses mm -hmm. testifying mm -hmm. on their behalf, a, a bit of a bogus witness it, mm -hmm. as it happens but I enjoy mm -hmm. doing it um, so all, all these different protests combined served to ensure that we were permanently testing and judging the government and holding it to account on climate policy mm -hmm. and, and that is a good thing and I, I don't want to be misunderstood I really do think that, that that's one of the reasons why we're beginning to see progress politically and and in terms of the behavior of corporations but there is a 
it, 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 but climate change belongs in a much bigger context, mm -hmm. and that's the, the, our relationship with the natural world. Climate change itself is a symptom of a dysfunctional relationship between us as a species and the natural world, and that context was just lost completely. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I think we began to lose supporters, people who can understand mm -hmm. that it's not a good thing to wipe out the world's forests. It's not a good thing to, to exhaust the world's oceans when you've got a billion people mm -hmm. depending on fish for their main mm -hmm. source of protein. It's not clever. All those people who, 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 who common sense dictates should be our allies where our allies began to drop off as they lost interest in carbon. The high point seemed to be Copenhagen and that, the huge hype and expectation yeah. before it that the world to, could yeah. actually come up with a decent agreement. Yeah. And since then, it's, it's slightly fallen off. I think it has fallen off, but we, we will... I think what we're going to see, actually, because international agreements tend to be a reflection of where politics is already at. They don't tend to move the, the decision-making process forward at all. Uh, in a sense, they provide a timeline for com countries to, to try and adapt to. But on the whole, America's never going to sign up to anything that isn't already acceptable to America. And the same applies to other countries. So it's a good measure of where countries are at. But I think where, where things are different now, as opposed to where they were during that decade, I'm speaking about it if it was a century ago, mm -hmm. um, is, is that we're going to see much more bilateral activity. So we'll see China developing its own cap and trade type system. They're already doing six different trials. As mm -hmm. you know, one of them will be picked and it'll become national. Mm -hmm. Australia has, has put into legislation mm -hmm. a climate change act not a million miles away from our own. And we'll see the sort of emergence of a global carbon market and global carbon targets and so on. And you'll find then that countries like America will have to join in because that's where the economy is going. And they, they won't do it for ethical reasons. They'll do it because to not do it would mean that they'd be left behind in this sort of clean or, or low carbon revolution that we're seeing globally. So it's not it's not going to be the big macro giant global statements that that we're, that we're going to be seeing. What about for green uh, lobbying and and uh, environmental? Because that's becoming more and more global, isn't it? I mean, there's a, there's a um, there's, with the internet and whatever, it's very easy mm -hmm. now for groups in Hong Kong and yeah. China and absolutely yeah. everywhere to yeah. to connect up. So yeah, and, and that's a very good way of showing. It's a good way of giving countries a platform that don't otherwise have a, a platform. So you've got, for example, the president of Gabon mm -hmm. wanting to be the shining jewel in Africa mm -hmm. in terms of conservation. He's, mm -hmm. he's only been in for a few years, but his conservation plans, if they're carried out, mm -hmm. are going to make Gabon really a very unique example of valuing ecosystems and so on. I wonder whether all that would happen if it wasn't for the fact that the world is able to look at Gabon and, mm -hmm. and, and, and praise Gabon where, where appropriate in, in a way that simply wasn't possible you know, 10, 20 years ago. Equally, you've got you've got um, organisations like a new organisations like Avaz who can Fantastic. mobilise two million yeah. people yeah. to appeal to the Brazilian government Absolutely not to right. enact various laws. So yeah. I mean, that, th these uh, are these are new these movements countries. which are which are emerging. Absolutely right, and it matters to these countries. Countries are so really almost disproportionately aware of the reputation they have, which is why you're seeing some countries breaking ranks and doing some interesting things. Do you think the environmental so, agenda is then shifting from the north to the south? Is it is it is it now much more a southern? I'm, I'm not sure whether it's north to south. I think it's I think it's more international perhaps than it, before it was really north and I think now it's global. I don't think the north is losing interest. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it, it's reflected in, t take the Department for International Development. You've got a, an organization there which was dishing out money to deal with poverty, but with no regard at all for the environment, even mm -hmm. though really bad base poverty mm -hmm. tends to be caused by erosion of the environment. The people who depend on the free mm -hmm. services nature provides are the poorest people, cut down the forest, mm -hmm. they're plunged into poverty. You've seen a massive shift in, in, in the way DFID money is being mm -hmm. spent with a big emphasis on environmental regeneration. And that's not just a British thing, that's happening around the world. You've got whether it's Norway, whether it's Australia, whether it's France. So I think you're seeing a joining of the dots. You don't have environment on the one hand, people on the other, mm -hmm. poverty on the one hand, development mm -hmm. on the other. All these things are coming together, and I think that's a good thing. I mean, I'm, I'm probably conveying it in a, a spirit of, 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 of optimism, which is not really a reflection of where I am. But I do think there are some signs of progress, and I think things are moving broadly in the right direction. One thing which wasn't on the agenda at all in the, in, for, for the last 10 years has really been population. What happened there? Population disappeared as an issue, and there are a lot of people who see that as a kind of conspiracy. You know, the, these Greens, they were happy to talk about carbon and so on, but they won't touch population. And, and I don't think it is a conspiracy. I think it's just a really difficult issue. It's not obvious how one would deal with it. Uh, and it's, it, it, Some people will take the line, well, it's not really about population, it's about consumption. You know, the average U.S. person consumes you know, 30, 40 times more than the average person in Ethiopia for example. But, but actually population is an issue and, there's a, and I think there's never been a real denial of that. But when it comes to being 
constructive and coming up with solutions, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. you know, no one supports the Chinese one-child mm -hmm. policy. Uh, uh, people tend to believe in, in the right of people and families and communities to mm -hmm. choose. And really the best we've come up with so far is, is family planning mm -hmm. funding in other countries. But there's, you know, there's a big question mark about how effective that has really been. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think people have backed away from getting too involved in population issues because it's just so difficult. And a lot yeah. of people basically, I think, feel that nature's going to take care of that one. One of the very big issues in Britain in the last 10, 15 years has been wind farms and yeah. uh, the you know, desecration of the uplands or not. Um, I mean, where, where do you think that, I mean, that, did that debate come out unexpectedly to you? Or was I, no, I think we handled it very bad. I said we, maybe, I don't know, the environmental movements. On the one hand, we're very democratic. And, and obviously there are lots of different, it's not a homogenous movement, but on the whole, people who are keen on the environment, people who are throw their lives into protecting the environment, tend to believe in democracy as well. And yet when it comes to things like wind farms, there's, there's a sort of intolerance when it comes to democracy, local people, what are they doing, say no to wind farms. Mm. But actually, if you look at Wales, for example, and compare it with England, in Wales, wind farms are quite popular, and they're popular because there's much more local involvement about where they're put and I how they're I do, I do, I would actually disagree, it's only mid Wales. Um, uh, why not the, the pylons are, um, I mean, they pull them down. There are, there is, in terms of the number of local action groups per site that are picked, it's dramatically less, but I'm not saying, mm. okay, I'm sure there are exceptions there. But it's the same, I suppose, with the nuclear industry in France. Nuclear power is less unpopular in France than it is elsewhere, partly because you've got this, this sort of localized taxation mm. system where mm. local communities benefit directly from nu nuclear power plants being built. Um, a bit like landfill tax used to be in this country mm. when it was first initiated. So I think, you, I think you have to work with communities. I don't think anyone likes having these things imposed on them. You need much more democratic democratic involvement. But also on the issue of subsidies, I think that you know it is probably the case that within three years, maybe four years, there will be no need for subsidies for onshore wind. It's going to achieve parity. Most people in the, in the, in the industry accept that. Mm. So I think we should be saying that. I think mm. we should be saying that we're going to phase the subsidies out. Mm. And yes, there are going to be subsidy junkies in the industry who are going to mm. scream and yell, but anyone who's being honest about it will recognize that that's probably about right. Um, so I, I, I think that debate will probably I think it'll become, I think the people who are opposed will probably dwindle in number, mm. not grow, as long as the government gets it right. As long mm. as there's a recognition of the importance of democracy and that subsidies don't exist or shouldn't exist to prop up old technologies mm. like nuclear mm. power, mm. they should actually be there to kickstart new technologies. Well, meanwhile, for the last two and a half years, we've had a coalition government, which you've been part of, mm. uh, and it claims to be the greenest you know, ever. I mean, is, is, is that fair? Will history laugh at that or will history uh, actually sort of clap its hands? It's, it's a di it genuinely different. I mean, I've been very critical of the government on, for, uh, on, on its green agenda, and I've written rude articles, including in your, your very brilliant newspaper, uh, criticizing the government for not doing enough. But, but if you look at where the, what the government is doing and what it said it would do in opposition, I'm talking about the Conservative Party, we are delivering. I mean, it's not that we've abandoned green pledges, whether it's a, a renewable heat incentive or the, uh, uh, the Green Investment Bank or the Green Deal. All these things exist. They're just, in my view, not quite enough. We need to turbocharge the Green Investment Bank so that it can actually issue bonds much quicker than, than is currently anticipated. We need to turbocharge the Green Deal so that we see industrial scale uh, 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 energy efficiency. We're not going to unless we turbocharge it. So my critique is that we're not going enough. But, but the biggest problem with this government is that you've got a schizophrenia. You've got one element of it which is very, very keen on, uh, uh, on low carbon policy, for example. You've got others who are really passionate about uh, biodiversity and so on. There are plenty of allies in the front line of British mm -hmm. politics today. The problem is the Treasury. It's always been the Treasury and it remains a Treasury today, that there is an absolute failure to recognize the opportunities in this transition to a clean and green economy. Uh, and there are massive opportunities. I don't need to tell you, you've written about them enough. But, but they're there, and the Treasury is blind to them. And for as long as the Treasury... But to be sees, fair, it's not, it's, not it's not just the Treasury. I mean, you know, the idea of selling off all the forests, the, uh, the, 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 the planning, yeah. whatever, has caused great But, 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 well, but those, things didn't, th those things didn't happen as a result of a general agreement within the government. Take planning. There was a major battle on that, major battle, and, and actually the Treasury was very much part of it. And you had the Department for Local Government, you had the elements of DEFRA as well, campaigned very hard for a, a rewriting of the first draft of the planning mm -hmm. document. I know because I was very much part of that campaign. Mm -hmm. I got 45 coalition MPs, almost all of them Tory, to write a very, very rough letter to the government saying, if you don't rewrite these plans, if you don't But it was the instinct of the government to come up with a pile of absolute but, but who, rubbish. But, but, you, but you're, you're right, it was a pile of rubbish. But, but when you say the government, it's not a single 
entity. It's mm -hmm. just, there are so many conflicting parts and so many different views, and the same applies across the board. If you talk to people in DEC or DEFRA or even the CLG about low carbon growth, for example, they get it, they understand mm -hmm. it, just as on the whole they understood the importance of getting the planning stuff right. Mm -hmm. If you talk to the Treasury, they don't. They see environmentalism as a kind of cost, as a box that you do have to tick for political mm -hmm. reasons, but you make the tick as small as possible, mm -hmm. and then you move on and deal with the real stuff. It, it is a, there is a kind of schizophrenia there. It's a problem. I it's think, a schizophrenia exactly. in deep, deep in the Tory party as well. I mean, if you uh, look uh, at sure, over 30, sure. 40 years, for sure. yeah. I mean, how has the Tory brain but, evolved on the well, environment? With that, I mean, probably more so than the other parties, the Conservative Party, is a mixed bag. Um, you, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel very much a conservative, but there are people in the Conservative Party with whom I would disagree on every conceivable issue. I mean, we're both conservative, mm -hmm. and we both exist perfectly comfortably and happily mm -hmm. up to a point mm -hmm. in, in the Conservative Party. So it's, um, it, it's, it, it's just the nature of the Conservative Party. I mean, you can, you know, you can draw inspiration from Burke, or you can, you know, take the kind of more neocon approach, which is, you know, which is also conservative, but very, very. And very at the moment, is the neocon approach seems no, to be I, the. I think there's a mixture. I mean, I think you know we've. We, I think we are going to. We are making progress in terms of low carbon mm -hmm. policy. Policy. Um, I think we had a really bad moment in relation to the forests and planning, but we managed to claw back from that. I think we're going to see a big emphasis over the next uh, few months and the next year on biodiversity on a big scale. I think some really interesting things happening, which I'd love to be able to talk about, and we'll do that another time. Um, but, but good things. Um, it's it, it's a mixed bag. I think it's it's about you know I, I just simply have to hope that the the sort of more environmentally minded elements of the Conservative Party and I'm not an, an absolute minority. Mm. I wouldn't say I'm in the majority, mm. but we just have to make sure that the Conservative Party stays true to what I think are its real roots. I mean, mm. conservative you know, some of the best environmental policy ever has come from. Well, you're being very historic environment, historic <laughs> conservative governments. It's a battle. I mean, I own the Conservative Party as a, as a member, as an MP, and just as much as any other MP, just as much as any other member. My job is to try and influence it and take part in the big battle of ideas and make sure that it does indeed become the greenest government ever. I can't say it is yet, but I hope it will be remembered in that way. But it's a battle. It's in, a real in, battle. In, in two or three weeks' time, we've got yeah. the Rio uh, Summit Mark II, yeah. um, and our own. David Cameron's not going to go. Uh, the, 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 I mean, has, has environment dropped off the, the, the world map in that sense, or is it just shifting from place to place? I mean, is it now too embarrassing to talk about the environment in a time of a recession? Or? I, I, do, I, think you, like, I think there's, there's an element of truth in that. I think when people... I mean, environment has rarely been the top of people's list. If you have 100 people in the room and you ask them what the top three or four concerns are, it's going to be a reflection of where they're at. If they haven't got any... You know, local schools that are any good, they're going to worry about schools. If they haven't got a home, they're going to worry about shelter. If they haven't got, you know, food, they're going to worry about food. And, and, and the environment that was kind of being pushed further and further down as these other problems are heaping, growing, growing, growing. It doesn't take away from the fact that the environment is the most important issue. I mean, it clearly is the most important issue without a viable environment, we have no economy. It's as simple as that. But, but has the environment so, movement failed so, then? In, in I, I don't think it's failed. I think that we, I, it's perhaps the case that we haven't fully adjusted to the situation we're in at the moment where there's a lot less money, where when we call for solutions, they've got to work with the grain. They've got to be solutions which, uh, which have you know, written into them a recognition of the fact that there's no money, that we're in a recession, mm -hmm. that it's going to be some time before we recover. But I think we can do that because I think if, if we're going to get through this, this economic mess that we're in at the moment, it'll be through a different type of growth, I hope. Mm. Uh, not all growth is bad. I mean, we, you know, it's, 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 there's, there's plenty of things that I'd love to see grow much, much more rapidly and healthily than, than is the case at the moment. And I think green growth is, I, I, for me, it's, it's a no-brainer. Mm. So if we, can, if we can encourage that as, as not just as an alternative to what we have at the moment, as actually as, as a solution to the economic mess we find ourselves in at the moment. I think we will hit a nerve in a positive sense. I hope so. You might but, also hit a nerve with Mr. Osborne, do you think? Well, that, 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 that's, that's very true. Yes, we do, we do. George Osborne isn't, I wouldn't describe him as a, as a, as a green campaigner. But which part yes. of the Tory green man does he come from? Is, is, is he the, the Birking, Burke end or is he the... Talking about George Osborne? Yes. I just don't know is the answer. I really can't answer that. Um, he doesn't seem to understand but, environment. But we, we are going to be having a, we're going to have a big debate in Parliament shortly on 
green growth. And mm -hmm. it'll be very interesting to see. I think you'll find that there'll be, it'll be very, very well represented by unusual conservatives, people who aren't associated with these ideals who will stand up and talk. A lot of the, the, you can divide environmentalism in three in the Conservative mm -hmm. Party. You've got people who understand green growth because mm -hmm. it's business, and they recognize that there are jobs to be created in moving in this transition. They recognize you can't get from here to here without opening up all kinds of opportunities. Um, you've got other people for whom climate isn't really the issue, but nature is, conservation, food security, bread baskets, you know, water shortages, these sorts of issues. Um, and then you've got other people, the sort of third and much smaller bag of people who kind of unite the two, and I would see myself as one of those people, somebody who, has, who recognizes that the, the ecosystems themselves cannot be reinvented, no matter how clever we are with technology, and once they're gone, they're gone, we're in real trouble. But the recognition also that the economy that we that can benefit by, by doing the right thing. I don't think it's a choice between the economy and the environment anymore, but we've just got to prove that. We've got to make that point as loud as we can. Thank you also. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.